Tommy Kester. This is Sports Daily on Wichita's number one sports radio, 97.5 and 12.40 KFH. Welcome back, everybody. It is Sports Daily. Glad to be here with you on this Friday edition. TGIF, Jacob Albrock, Tommy Castor, alongside you here. Driving the way, Jad Chambers producing for us. Pat, our winner of coffee and tea from HTO. Congratulations, Pat. Enjoy it on us here at Sports Daily. Uh, it is Friday, and uh, it is Boy, it is uh, it is go time. I think Tommy to the crazy season. We're so close. Uh, TBT will have a great weekend there, but training camps are in session, and that just sort of tells us that football's around the corner. Training camp. I will say this though: do we do hit a lull in training camp uh, once we get there? You know, preseason's kind of dragging. But man, you're going to start to get you know high school football practices and college football practices and like all this stuff. And we've got these dramatic holdouts potentially looming over the NFL and maybe two of them with high profile players. If Josh Jacobs and Saquon Barkley both go for it. So it's an interesting time for the chiefs. Still no Chris Jones deal. Um, You know, that's, that's, I think become the biggest storyline there. The other big storyline for the chiefs, as far as on the field was sort of Isaiah Pacheco, but, Tommy, you know, it sounds like uh, it sounds like he's going to be fine. He said he'd, quote, absolutely be ready for the start of the season. We talked about this yesterday. Boy, it'd be nice if they could get him out there and just sort of shut it down, right? I don't think Pacheco's yeah. wired that way, but that'd be nice, especially if we know he's good to go, which it sounds like he is. And I don't know if that means he doesn't need work in camp or he does need work in camp, but that's a good sign for the Chiefs. Yeah, no, without a doubt. And uh, it was nice to see Pacheco, um, you know, talk to the media yesterday and talk about how healthy he is and how, you know, he feels and that he feels 100% and all of that. That was good. Um, You know, and of course, I think he's going to say that regardless, even if he wasn't. Uh, But the fact that he's been there, I mean, there was a real legitimate concern that we wouldn't see him show up in training camp and that he would have to start the season on the pup list. And it's been exactly the opposite. He's been working, looks like at full strength, at full go uh, here the first couple of days of training camp. But I'm with you. Now that we know that he's good and he's talked to the media and he's practiced a couple of days, what more do you need to see from him? Shut him down, get him ready to go for week one. Yeah, and and he may he may think that he needs the work, and they may think that he needs the work. And and if it's in practice, I'm probably okay with it. But I don't need to see him in a preseason game. Um, so Chris Jones, Andy Reid said, well, "What is today? Friday? I think it was Tuesday uh, that they don't know if Chris Jones is going to be there." Veterans report today. I'm not sure what time they report. It's usually early. Um, but we we haven't heard that. That's going to be. I mean, it's going to get reported by like a thousand um, as soon as that happens. So we'll just keep an eye on it, I guess, with Chris Jones. I, Chris Jones is not going to give a discount. I don't think if that was going to happen, he'd already done it. So we're not going to get a Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey situation. He wants to be paid. I think everybody on the planet knows what he wants to be paid, which is more than Quinn and Williams, who just signed his new deal. I'm not quite sure what the holdup is here now, Tommy. It's it's you know we thought this would get done like in 24 hours, which you know was sort of like that. All right, we got the framework of this thing. Just we need to put that final number, you know, a dollar more than Quinn wins. But I, I, boy, I don't know now. I'm not sure what's taking so long here. I'm still not at a point where I'm concerned about it yet. What if he doesn't show up today? I that's fairly common, right? Like when you've got players that are working on a contract extension to hold out briefly in training camp. I think if it drags on long-term, uh, you know, if, if this goes on a few more weeks and we're actually getting into, you know, training camp continues and then preseason and all of that at that point. Yeah. Let's get, you know, the, the alarm bells ringing, but right now, and especially because it's been awfully quiet, 
I think if there was a lot of contention, we would be hearing about it, uh, at least to an extent, from one side or another. I mean, it could be Jones's representatives being vocal about how the Chiefs aren't working with them. We're not hearing that. It could be leaks from the Chiefs side saying that Chris Jones isn't working with them. We're not really hearing that. So the fact that it's still quiet on both sides tells me that it's still not contentious. And until I start hearing that sort of thing, I'm not going to be I'm not going to be concerned about it. What about okay? So the the preseason starts in a little more than three weeks. August thirteenth is the first preseason game. Is that the date that you've got circled? Is all right now? I'm concerned if they get into the preseason, or yeah, is there I think a so. date? I See, think I so. think it's I, probably I think a little so. sooner than that. I, I think that's too long. I, I I would venture to guess that ten days from now, if we're sitting here and Chris Jones hasn't reported and there's no deal, I would think we're going to have concern at that point. I think the concern's closer than that. Um, because a holdout's a holdout, right? Like, that's not good. It's not good optically anyway. Unless Chris Jones just said, hey, guys, you know, I'm not going to show up till we get it done, but I'm confident we're going to get it done. Then it's like, okay, fine. But, I, you know, I don't know how you – I don't know how you count on that, right? Like, you know, that's that's pretty optimistic. And I know we've remained optimistic because Chris Jones – isn't you know taking the bait on saying anything negative, but they gotta have Chris Jones and and I don't know what the holdup. What would be the reservation if you were Brett Veach? Like if you were Brett Veach, what would be the reservation? I don't think anybody has any issue making Chris Jones, you know the the second highest paid player at the position behind Aaron Donald, which we've heard again has been the number sort of. So as long as all of a sudden Chris Jones hasn't said, no, I want to make more than Aaron Jones. So let's just assume, right, that he wants to settle in above Quinn and Williams' new deal. And it's – what would be the reservation if you're Brett Veach? On a three-year deal? No, I don't think I'd have much concern. Four-year deal? Maybe? Like, I don't yeah. I don't know what it is that might be it's, holding this up. It's probably not the money. It's probably the duration of the contract. That's I would imagine that might be, you know, where – if there is a reservation, I'm still not convinced that there is, uh, but if there is any kind of hesitation or reservation from the mind of Brett Veach in the Chiefs front office, it would probably be with that. I don't think the money is an issue. I think it's the length of time if there if there is. Uh, I think that part of the reason why I'm not yet concerned about this is because what other option do the Chiefs have at that position? They don't. Like, they don't have any other option at that position. And that's not the way that Brett Beach operates. You know, and we've seen it throughout the years, you know, basically when Brett Beach is going to make a decision to do something else at a certain position. They draft a replacement. They sign a replacement. They do these different things where you can kind of telegraph and, and understand, all right, like there, there might be a change made here at this you know certain position. They don't have anybody else on the you know interior D line that they can replace Chris Jones with it's Chris Jones or bust and knowing how Brett Beach operates he's not going to go into the preseason and especially into week one not having you know some sort of backup plan he doesn't have a backup plan at all for Chris Jones so they're going to get a deal done unless they don't Right, like at what point did the Chiefs have to draw a line? In the you don't have any other I, choice but to get a, a, a deal done. Well, they you don't. Do. You, they move on without it if they don't think it's a sound business that, decision. That it who just are doesn't. You, who are you? Who are you replacing? Well, you with? don't. That's what I mean. The risk is that you don't have a good replacement. But if right. you know, if, if they didn't have a good replacement for Tyreek Hill either, right? And and they made that decision, and you know that you're not going to replace Tyreek Hill, so they have had to make those types of decisions. Now, again, I, I don't have any any thought whatsoever that this doesn't get resolved. But we've got the Quinn and Williams deal now. You know, before when it was OTAs, it's like, well, there's not much the Chiefs can do because they have to wait on this other deal. The other deal's there now. So now what are we waiting for? That's what I can't figure out. That's what, I, that's what I'm not sure of. Is it guaranteed money? Is it length of contract? He's 29 years old. I mean, I don't, how long was the Quinn and Williams deal? Um, let me pull up that contract. Quinn Williams is younger. Year, four years? Um, let's I want to say it was three or four. Quick. Yeah, Quinn Williams, number one, Quinn Williams is 25 years old. Um, and I, I don't know, you know, 
how you compare the length of it is four year deal and thirty two it's a, it's fully guaranteed. It was a fully guaranteed contract. Does that sound right? I think it was. Yeah. Um so if uh, let's see, four years. Oh no, that's incorrect. Four years, ninety-six million. Um, his his entire salary this year is fully guaranteed. The signing bonus of twenty, of just under twenty-five million. Um, the total guaranteed is sixty-six million out of the ninety-six million. Maybe it's four years. Maybe the Chiefs aren't comfortable with four years, and maybe that's what Chris Jones wants. Look, he got a four-year deal. Right. I want a four-year deal, but I don't know that that's totally fair, right? We'll give you more money. And here's what I would do if I was the Chiefs, by the way. If I see that contract and you know that you want Chris Jones and maybe you just do it, you know, I I don't know how you do it, but maybe you just give a bigger total guarantee, but not the length of the deal. So you don't take the cap hit later on if you have to like, all right, Chris, what if we give you a three year deal, but we'll guarantee you 70 million out of it on a three year deal. You've got more guaranteed money than Quinn and Williams, right? You're going to make more money than him. But here's what we can do because we're not comfortable with four years when you're 29 years old. I don't know how defensive tackles hold up in age. How old's Aaron Donald? Let me look that up too. Um, but Chris Jones has been, look, he's been as good as Aaron Donald production-wise. Aaron Donald's 32, so he's got three years on him. Chris Jones is a better player than Aaron Donald last year. Last year, right? And I'm not saying he's a better player. Aaron Donald is one of, if you listen to scouts and coaches, one of, if not the most talented football players that's ever lived. But Chris Jones was more productive last year. So that that that's the interesting dynamic of this is that he's 29 years old, is at the peak, right? He's incredible. He's highly important. So what is the holdup then in this contract well, negotiation? Like, again, I, I think it, it might be the length of time. And, and let me pose this question to you and this is what i uh, my thought process through all of this if a deal doesn't get done with chris jones who are you going to roll out on the defensive line interior defensive line for week one of the season Derek naughty is, is typically there but Treshawn wharton who had been another interior defensive lineman is coming back from a torn acl may not be ready to go i think he's going to start the season i believe on the pup list who else you got who else you got to start on on the interior defensive line you know, the, the Chiefs had 10 defensive linemen on their roster last year. Six of them were edge rushers. Four of them were interior defensive linemen. Chris Jones was one of them. Derek Naughty was the other. Uh, what was another one of them? What, what other what other option do you have? I mean, I guess it's, you could go. You could go to the free agent pool, I guess, and try to find someone like Danny Shelton. You're going to trot out 49 year old Danny Shelton to play to start week one on the interior defensive line. I don't, I mean, I don't think so. So what other option does Brett Beach have other than to eventually, I think that's the key word there, eventually solidify a contract extension. So Chris Jones doesn't hold out because you I mean, it's an understatement to say that, you know, he is a, an essential part. I mean, he is, he is the defense for Kansas City. Yep. So th- there is no other option but to to sign him to a long-term deal. He's as important to the defense as Travis Kelsey is to the offense. I'm not going to say Patrick Mahomes because that's not true. But he's as important, I think, as Travis Kelsey is right now on the other side of the ball. And, yeah, they don't have another good option. But, I, boy, I do not see the Chiefs as an organization lately that are going to negotiate scared either. Like, if they don't have another option, that doesn't mean they're going to make a bad deal here. Um, so Aaron Donald right now makes 20, uh, it makes just under, we'll call it $32 million a year. Quinn and Williams just got $24 million a year. So, I mean, the easy per year average to me is $28 million. Quinn and Williams got guaranteed $66 million. Aaron Donald, $95 million. So... If it's, you know, if it's third, what did we say? 28 million, right? If yeah. it's, uh, if it's, you know, probably, you know, you're probably looking at 75 million guaranteed to get in the middle of those guys. I mean, on a three year deal at 28 million, you're just over that, right? Like, so I, again, that's the part of it to me that isn't, and in, 
from the player's perspective, and this is where the NFL gets trickier than like Major League Baseball because there's you don't have to worry about the guarantees. You don't have to worry about any of that. If you're Chris Jones and the, you know, it's all about the guaranteed money. None of the other stuff matters, really. So as long as the guaranteed money lands somewhere between Quinn and Williams and Aaron Donald, does the length right. of time on the contract even matter? Like the total dollars matters, but why? Yeah, the like, total guaranteed dollars for sure and how it's structured. Right. I, you know, that all, that all plays into it. Um, here are the defensive tackles that are currently on the Chiefs roster. No, you I tell get me, it. outside yeah. of Chris Jones, who you no. want to have starting in week one. You got None. Chris Jones and Derek Nottie were the starters last year. Keandre Coburn, who was the sixth round pick out of Texas. So I guess you could start a rookie at defensive tackle if you if you wanted to. I don't think that's a smart play, but I guess you could. Matt Dickerson, don't know Matt Dickerson. Uh, he's a free agent signee. He's 27 years old. He got cut. He was part of training camp last year for the Chiefs. Got cut. Uh, Phil Hoskins, don't know him. He's a veteran free agent signee. Um, he was a seventh round pick of the Panthers in 2021. Then you've got Danny Shelton, former first round pick back in 2015, who is currently on your roster. And then Tershawn Wharton, who uh, has that ACL tour from last year, uh, is going to be rehabbing before he can come back. Daniel Wise is on the roster. He's the former KU guy. And Chris Williams, who's another veteran free agent, uh, he spent some time uh, as an undrafted free agent with the Colts. Those are your options right now in-house if you don't have Chris Jones ready to go. Let me reiterate again how important and awesome and amazing I think Chris Jones is. One of my favorite players in the league, absolutely unequivocally. None of those are better options than Chris Jones. There's not a defensive tackle in football right now, quite frankly, including Aaron Donald, that I think would be better than Chris Jones on this defense. Just let me put that out there. If Chris Jones didn't play a down of football for the Chiefs this year, Tommy, the Chiefs would still be the favorite to win the Super Bowl. It's a reality. You talk about the market a lot with these running backs and their value. The reality is if Chris Jones didn't play, was injured, holds out, whatever it is, the Chiefs are still going to be the favorite to win the Super Bowl, and they're still very likely going to be favored in every game they play this year by some degree. The only player that would alter that is Patrick Mahomes. That's it. Even if Travis Kelsey, I mean, I think Travis Kelsey might sway it a little more than Chris Jones, but even if something happened to Kelsey, the Chiefs are still going to be the favorite to win the Super Bowl because they have Patrick Mahomes. So, yes, he is critically important. The third most important player on this team, maybe the second most important player on this team. But the Chiefs aren't going to walk into that negotiation scared. The no. only player that should scare them in a negotiation is Patrick Mahomes. Everybody else is replaceable. That's where the NFL sits right now. And you want to talk about the market when we talk about running backs. Boy, the market's been telling us that for a long time. Look at what quarterbacks are getting paid. So, yeah, the Chiefs want to take care of Chris Jones and they want to do all this. What, what I keep going back to is, like, what is the holdup? Like, is this in any way, is there any part of this where it would make us sit here and think, you know what? I don't know if the Chiefs should do that. Like, let's just pretend that Chris Jones says, I'm 29 years old. I, I need more than Aaron Donald. Like, I need to be the highest paid guy. I've got a 99 Madden rating. Everybody knows how great I am. I, I want to be the highest paid guy. You do that if you're Kansas City for three or four years? I would. I would. Can they I afford it? I would still it? do that. Do you even know if they can afford that? Because well, I, I don't. Know. I mean, I, it, I feel like, and, and I could be wrong here because I don't know the inner workings and, and all of that, but if they can if they can pay him more than Quinn and Williams, if they can make him the second highest paid, well, they sure. can probably afford to make him the highest paid. I mean, it's a difference um, of like fifteen million a year. It's not as I easy wanna, as it sounds. I, I want to go back. I want to go back to your your comment before um, about them being the overall favorites, even without Chris Jones on the roster. Yeah, you're probably right about that. You are probably right that even without Chris Jones, they will be the favorites to win the championship and probably favored in every single game. But the margin of error it goes down significantly, right? Like, I, I really, I honestly believe that. You may still be favored, but maybe not by as much. And you, and you have to lean that much more 
on your offense. You have to lean that much more on Patrick Mahomes. Not saying he can't do it. He's shown time in, time out that he can. But I'm not sure that the Chiefs want to be in that position. Like, you remember when they played in the Super Bowl against the Buccaneers, and their offensive line was so bad, and they were exposed by the Bucs, and it was pretty it was pretty apparent, pretty blatant, you know, the way that that all went down. And there was that thought of, man, Mahomes is Superman, but it's it still is a team sport, and you got to have, you know, these other players around him. And I think that knowing how Chris Jones impacts that defense, I've said it before, and I'll say it again, he is more important on that roster than any other defensive player on any other team to the overall success or failure of a defense. That's what Chris Jones is. And so while I don't think that Brett Beach is going to be willing to make a quote unquote bad deal, I'm not sure there really is a bad deal that he can make with Chris Jones. Maybe if Chris Jones is absolutely outrageous in his demands, that might be a bad deal. But I think by all intents and purposes, I don't think that they're in, in the, in the scope of this negotiation, I'm not sure that there is a bad deal that Brett Beach could make. I, again, I think it's going to get done. We haven't heard anything to, to tell us otherwise. Um, I, I think it will happen. Let me give you, okay. So here's, here's how else I would present this. If you're the chiefs. Yeah. I think they could probably get the deal done for Chris Jones. And again, I think that they should don't misunderstand this conversation, but what if Chris Jones's demands are higher than you anticipated and you have this strategic plan mapped out, right, on what you're going to do with the roster? But what if Chris Jones' demands get to the point where it inhibits you from, you know, from any combination of Willie Gay, um, uh, you know, Derek Nottie, um, go down the list, and here's where it gets really interesting is Creed Humphrey. Trey Smith, uh, Marcus McDuffie. It's, you know, it's too early to really be concerned about Sky Moore at this point. But you know, Isaiah Pacheco at some point. Uh, there's, I said Marcus McDuffie, Trent McDuffie, uh, George Karloftis, right? Some of these players that you really think are a part of the future. If you spend a lot in on some, you you have to say goodbye to a lot of those players. So. Are, are you willing to give up Willie Gay and Legereus Sneed if you go and get, you know, Chris Jones for more than you anticipated in this master plan you have? What about Creed Humphrey and Trey Smith, right? What about Travis Kelsey at some point? Uh, you know, there are a lot of there's – a, there's a lot of ripple effects that come if Chris Jones is going to ask for or want more than the if you're Brett Veach, the plan you've mapped out. And that's where difficult decisions have to come in because as Chris Jones – you know, the second or third most important player on the team, yes, he is. But is he more important than any combination of those guys? I'm not so sure at 29 years old. I think that I think he is, depending on the on the players. Like, I, I want to keep that, that offensive line intact by, as much as I can. They're protecting Patrick Mahomes. But if you're talking about a combination of Willie Gay and, and Trent McDuffie, I like those guys a lot. Those were really, really good draft picks by Kansas City. And there's nothing saying they can't do that again. Uh, so I, I think it depends on the combination of players. I don't, again, I don't, I'm not advocating for them to, you know, get rid of those guys necessarily, but I don't know. I'm, I'm still bullish on, you've got to have Chris Jones anchoring that defense. If you want to have a legitimate chance to go back to back, I think that again, they'll be favored even if they don't have him, but to really legitimately say that they're going to go back to back and, and win another championship you got to have a maker in that defense. I don't know. Again, I love Chris Jones. But, I think you do. I, I mean, think Tommy, you do. if Chris, if this all gets settled and Chris Jones, you know, for, you know, tweaks a knee in week 16 or 17, you don't think the Chiefs would have a legitimate chance to win a Super Bowl? I'm not, I'm not saying that in a situation like that, that they wouldn't. I, again, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying you don't have Chris Jones, you don't win a championship. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying your margin of error gets smaller if you don't have him on the well, field. Sure and, and, I, and I think that Brett Beach especially would want to make sure that you are keeping that advantage as much as you can by having him on the field and signing him long term.
If you're Veach, though, and Humphrey and Trey Smith are both now two years away from free agency playing on rookie deals, what do you think the chances are they both go quietly into 2025 without a deal? I think it's low. I mean, I don't think that happens. So you have all these players you have to consider when you're talking about Chris Jones. And I'm just, like, trying to understand the situation. So for the Chiefs, you have all these players that are going to want deals, like, soon. The, the bad thing about having a great draft class is, like, they're all free agents at the same time, right? And they've had two great draft classes in a row. So they've got all these players that they're going to have to take care of. The only player that would keep them and their chances in a big picture from going down is Patrick Mahomes. That's the marketplace of the NFL. It's wild, it's crazy, but it's reality. So I do understand there's some complexity here, which is why I really want to know what the holdup is. Like, is the holdup something that compromises long-term stuff for the Chiefs, or is it semantics? I don't know the answer to that. And I think that's the important part of the question, because the Chiefs can't cave on what also they have to do long-term with the roster. I, I guess where I'm at is that I think it is semantics until I hear I otherwise. And there's nothing that has said that it's anything but Except that. that it's not done yet. That's what says uh, it. Yeah, but that, I mean, that at that point you're speculating that it's there's something more well, know, sinister going on. And, and I, I don't think sinister. there is. It's, it's totally fair to speculate that because right now, well, we'll see if he shows up to camp today, I guess. That'll... <laughs> that'll uh, That'll escalate to speculation for sure. 869-1240 is the number to call. We'll come back. We'll continue that conversation. Uh, Pac-12 Media Day. I believe the Pac-12 commissioner is about to speak here publicly for the first time since December. Uh, He actually has. I have quotes from him. We'll have that next on Sports Day. media day <sighs> what a blast Call i'm getting Rocky mad Caster. here i'm getting mad are you getting I, mad I, at I this i'm reading klavikov's comments it's making me mad it's not making me mad because i don't think he has a choice and i honestly like i don't know what he's supposed to do publicly uh, i mean look everybody in the world knows you don't have a deal uh you thought you'd have a deal by now you can say that you you know you can say whatever you want everybody knows it um i just don't know what he's supposed to say like the deal's not there yet. The deal he wants isn't there yet, and they're going to wait until, you know, the last minute, I think, until a deal he wants gets there. And the question becomes, does the economy and, you know, the landscape allow that to happen? I'm not sure that it does. But if it's not there now, and, and let's let's look at it this way. If the deal's not there now, what is better or worse for the Pac-12, to take a bad deal or to wait? No, look, I don't have I, I'm not disagreeing with you on this stuff. My problem, he's lying. But he's what's he going to say? He's lying. I don't know. I mean, like, I feel like everybody can see through this. Like, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know right. that he's lying in everything that he, like, what this is one of his quotes. See him do? This is, this is one of his quotes. We are not announcing the TV deal today on purpose because I want the focus to be on football. Lies. That is a lie. It's a, I mean, like that is, that's not true. And everybody on the face of the planet knows that that's not true. So there might be another way to say it, but man, like you're blatantly lying to everybody there. All right, Tommy, we both, uh, you know, we both dabble and understand the world of PR pretty well. Um, let's say that you're in that chair and the situation that exists has presented itself. Sure. What would you say? Well, first off, I would have attacked this a year ago and, you know, tried to at least create a narrative a year ago that's better than what he did, right? Like, I would hope to never be in that, in like, this particular position right now on July 21st, 2023, because he's in this position right now because of what he said a year ago, right? And and, and so I, you needed to be out in front of this a year well, but ago. who knows if he could have gotten a deal done then? I mean, the reality is he got outplayed by the Big 12. They did their deal first. That's right. that's the reality, right? The optics early on. But let's say you're presented with the scenario now where that happened, right? You know, maybe, maybe, they, and maybe the networks wanted the Big 12 more than the Pac-12. There's nothing he can do about that. 
But let's say you're in this position now where you do not have a deal. A deal is not there that you want to take. And you've got a parade up there in front of reporters who have called your bluff, and you're very obviously bluffing. But in the PR, right. PR world, people bluff all the time. We we, we got to <laughs> – I'll give you an example. So – and I don't know all the details of this because I didn't cover this story yesterday. I, I guess like the new you know Panasonic battery plant, right, That that is uh, opening – our energy rates are going to go up to help facilitate that. So – our you know, investigators yesterday are asking all these people. We get a statement back from the governor that says there will be downward pressure on the rates after we got a statement from Evergy that said, yeah, basically we got to pay for this stuff. And you know that kind of falls on everything, just like anything when we do the rates. So we know that that's a bluff. We know that that's – what does downward pressure on the rates mean? Like are the rates going up or are they not going up? Well, they're going up. We know they're going up. So right. like in the PR world, even sometimes when it's blatantly obvious, you have to say like the wrong thing. And it's our job to call it out as we've right. appropriately done. But what is the alternative if you're in Clive Coffer, however you say his name's position right now, than to say, we think we're going to get a great deal? Are you going to sit up there and say, <laughs> gosh darn it, Brett Yormark got the best of me no, and now no, we're screwed and, and we just have but to I wait think, and hope? But and, I think, like, no, I, I do think it's okay, though, to, like if you want to blame – external factors out of your control that's one thing you could do that's not ideal but you could blame the landscape in the media world being more challenging yeah, than we anticipated you can't do that because you sure have you teams can. that might leave if you're sitting there saying we don't know if the landscape's going to garner this deal if you're arizona what are you going to do no, I think that like you can frame it in a way of saying, you know, we are still actively negotiating and we are optimistic that we are making progress as opposed to we have something that's really good. Just wait and see. Believe us this time because that's not true. And we all know that's not true. And you're making us look like fools by listening to you. And you look like the biggest fool out of all of them. So well, I think the, I think the foolishness comes in the people that have just blindly defended the Pac-12. Like I don't I don't blame its commissioner for that. He's he's trying to stall is what he's trying to do. The the people that to me look foolish because I don't think he has a choice. So I don't think that's him looking foolish. I think that's him with his back against the wall. I think the people that look foolish are the people that have blindly defended it. Like oh, you big hillbillies in the Big Twelve country, you just wait and see. Right, you just wait and see how great it is out here. It's like you're not paying attention. Like you're right. not paying attention to all the circum. That's who looks a little foolish to me here. They're the ones that have their feelings hurt because yeah. But like if you're in that world, you got to know PR enough to know this dude's totally full of it. They don't have a deal because there's not a deal to be had. So stop just blindly. And now they're. Now, I mean, you're seeing by some of the questioning today, <laughs> there's a little more aggressive pushback. I think. Uh, from that world, one example given by Stuart Mandel is, here's the quote. Uh, We're not announcing our media deal today on purpose because we want the focus to be on football. That's the one you brought up. And at this point in, you know, the Twitter, uh, uh, you know, translation of this press conference, there was there has not yet been a question about football, which is kind of funny. And then somebody followed up named James Kripea, who, who follows Oregon, right? And says, does on purpose mean there's a deal done and you're just not announcing it yet? And, and you know, that's an obvious call on the bluff. And he said, I think you're reading too much into that. But, like, those questions needed to be asked that way a long time ago. Now, he has not made himself available since December. That I do have a problem with. I have a problem with that. You don't get to be in that position and not answer questions. You got to answer questions. Whether you dance this dance that's okay because we can at least read into your answers. But when you just ignore it and never answer it, that I do have a problem with. Right. Because somebody like San Diego State in that scenario, by the way, kind of gets screwed. Right? San Diego State. And now he's saying today, like, we're not expanding anything until we get a media deal done. I'm going to guess that that wasn't always the case or San Diego State right. would, wouldn't have written that letter in the first place. And you know what? I also think that what Klyvikov has done to himself – and I have no sympathy for this guy because he has done it to himself. He's painted himself into a corner over the last 365 days where his only option when he's standing at a podium and taking questions is to blatantly lie. There is a difference. And we can argue the semantics of this, but there's a difference between a bluff and a lie. Right. And I think what Klavikov is doing is lying. Like it's not a bluff. It's a lie. Like, you know, I think that a bluff he, he did make a comment that I think you could consider 
a bluff. That that line is the longer we wait, the better our options get. That's a bluff because is we it can't a bluff or is it reality? Because the options are so bad now. That's how I, mean, I that, read that, that could that could very that could very well be the case. But I also think it's a bluff that like they don't have anything good right now. And right. they're crossing all their fingers and toes, hoping that they do get a better option. But it's a bluff because we can't prove it. Otherwise, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what the future says. I think that's a bluff. But for him to say we're not announcing a TV deal today because we want to focus on football, that is a lie. Like <laughs> there are those are diff- that, that that's different. That is a different, different kind of because he's not announcing it because because it's not there and they do want the focus. I'm sure he would love for the focus to be on football. They are potentially walking into a season where the Pac-12 will be more successful on the field than it's been in a decade. Like and the God football. bless that other reporter for following up and saying, does totally. that mean you yes, have one what, done and, and you're I not mean. announcing like, it today? Like, because they're that's amazing. They, because yeah. a lot of these bloggers in the, in the groups that have, you know, I'm sure that Utah's athletic director is embarrassed about this. Yeah. You know, like I would think every athletic director and every university president in that conference right now is embarrassed. Totally. That this is the this is totally. the press conference that's going now, on. Again, the 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 defeat comes and that the Big 12 swooped in and was able to have the foresight that there is value in us being first here because that was absolutely correct, right? The the mistakes and and all the vitriol need to be toward what happened initially, right? A long time ago. But I, I I expected nothing different than what we've seen so far out of Pac-12 Media Day because there is not another option. Look, nobody in his position is going to get up and say, hey, guys, the ship is sinking, but sink with us. We think we might find a lifeboat here. You're, you're mistaken on that because that's happened before. Do you remember Bob Bowlesby in the Big 12? Yeah, but he was on his way out. Of he went in front of politicians and said with Oklahoma and Texas leaving, the Big 12 would lose 50% of their yeah. revenue. So this is, I mean, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting Klyvikov would want to do that. I mean, that's, that's suicide right well, there as far as your wrong. career is concerned. But the, the, it is not, it's happened before where a commissioner has come in and painted a not so pretty picture. And I understand all of the, 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 ramifications of all of this and if Klyvikov didn't paint a a cheery picture uh then it would be you know a mass exodus potentially from that conference I just think that basically what is happening right now is that the conference the commissioner the bloggers the people who follow the conference they are all assuming that everybody else outside of their conference are complete and utter idiots and cannot read in to anything what they're saying and just believe them hook, line, and sinker that, oh, by gosh, it's going to be awesome. And we've heard this song and dance forever, and it's it's just not the truth. It's not the truth. <laughs> He's reading off a teleprompter, which is really funny. Uh, I just saw a picture of that. Um, so – Here's the part of this that, you know, obviously everything he's saying about the media deal is hogwash. We know that. We knew that before he got up there and said anything. Here's what I don't know, and here's what is interesting, is that lose, he, he says losing schools to the Big 12 is not a concern, and he says expansion doesn't happen until after a, after a media deal. That is where he might have some insight, right? And, and that's what I don't know. Like, how interested really – are Arizona and Colorado. Utah is doubling down. They don't appear to be interested for whatever dumb reason, as the Big 12 just added BYU, Utah does not seem to be interested. Um, In America, there's always been the promise of a better future, the land of opportunity, hope. Since the UA's founding, we've overcome big challenges. Together, we fought to secure our freedom to organize, our freedom to collectively bargain, our freedom to work at fair wages. In today's world, it's easy to be cynical about politics. But under this president, the UA has secured more victories than at any other time. President Biden's new laws to rebuild America are creating 114 million UA work hours. Union workers are going to transform America. It's about making things here in America again. It's about good jobs. And it's about damn time we're doing it. Joe Biden has delivered on UA infrastructure. He's protected our pensions and our gold standard UA apprenticeships. That's why the UA is backing Joe Biden for president. 
for our freedoms, for our members, for America. Joe Biden for president. We've, you know, we've seen all the reports that Arizona and Colorado would be, but here's where I don't as confident. I can't confidently. So I can confidently say that they are nowhere near a media deal. Like I'm pretty confident there. Yeah. What I can't confidently say is that anybody would be interested in joining the Big 12. I really don't know that. And that's the part of it that gets really interesting, right? Like there could be truth in we're we're unified here and waiting on this media deal because I don't think like the offer is going to leave the table for Arizona and Col- maybe Colorado's in a little danger, but for Arizona, like the offer's not going to leave the table. The Big 12 is going to want them on July 21st of 2023 or July 21st of 2024. You know what I mean? Like the, so I, I, I do think there could be some truth in that they're willing to ride this out with us, you know, until next year, because next year, if the Big 12 wants them, the same offer is essentially going to be. I don't think the Big 12 is going to pull its offer. No, but I do one. think I do think that and I had never thought of this before. And so this is a, a new wrinkle, at least in my mind, maybe not yours, but a new wrinkle in all of this that I had never thought of until we had Tim Fitzgerald yesterday, where he said he thinks that there could be a scenario where the Big 12 and Brett Yormark is like, I don't know if we really want you guys because of your lack of leadership and, and the way that it's been a mess with Colorado and Arizona and you can't make up your minds. I never thought, I mean, he said yeah. that yesterday. I've never thought about that before, that it could be Brett Yormark being like, man, you guys, it's a mess as far as your leadership I, I is would, concerned. I would tell this to Fitz. I, if Fitz, and I love Fitz to death, and I talk to Fitz about this stuff all the time. Fitz is a Big 12 homer. Uh, you know, as we are, but in his space, you can be, you can rile up the, you know, the Twitter bases of these other, at the end of the day, money talks, man. Like if, if Arizona makes the big 12 more profitable, the offer's always going to be on the table. Who cares? Just like Texas and Oklahoma, nobody has kicked more dirt in the face of the big 12 than Texas and Oklahoma. If for whatever reason, one of those schools wanted back in, they'd take them right this second. Uh, well, there, there's a big difference between Texas and Oklahoma and Colorado. I know and there is. But my point is, if Arizona makes them profitable, if the, if Arizona helps the league, they help the league. And that's what will ultimately decide something like is that. Is it a Not slam that, dunk, though, that those schools would help the league? Because really what you're, you're talking I think about Arizona is would. Slicing, slicing the pie into more pieces. No, you know, for because the, schools, because the right? agreement right now for the Big 12 is if they're currently a Power 5 school, they get in at that rate. So it doesn't slice the pie any differently. So they would get the exact same piece of the pie that everybody else gets. The deal just goes up. Now, the networks would have to approve that. So they'd have the ultimate right. say. But that is how that's built. Different if San Diego State comes in. If San Diego State came in, you could slice them a smaller piece of the pie. But if yeah. Arizona comes in, they just get the same thing everybody else gets. So, if you know, the market would tell you that. My guess is that for Arizona, yes, they enhance the league because of what they want to do with basketball. And it is an ascending to some degree football program, and you get the Phoenix market, right? So, yes, I would say they do. Colorado, probably because of the Denver market, but it's not as sure a thing, I don't think, as Arizona. Um, In Washington and Oregon, obviously, would. And that's probably the only four that I would be willing to, like, definitively say, yes, that enhances the, you know, the brand financially. Everybody else, you'd have to kind of make a case to me for. But not those four. Um, so, and we would find out, right? Like, again, I don't think that in the world where athletic directors change every three or four years that Brett Yormark saying, you know what, Arizona makes us more money, but that guy's a pain in my butt to call on the phone. Like, no, that's not going to hold them back from, from getting Arizona on board. That, that doesn't, to me, that doesn't make any sense because if Arizona makes more money, they make more money. If they expand their time zones and expands the footprint and does all these things, the NFL just dealt with Dan Snyder for 25 years on a much smaller scale, like a, a pain in the butt who's very confused and in a rock and a hard place right now anyway. I don't, I don't think that holds anything up. I think it's just, you know, do you change your expansion plan if you're the Big 12? That's the danger Arizona would run into, right? Like if they, if they decide to go elsewhere and do something different, then you could maybe get left out. That would be the danger. But I suspect for a school like Arizona, that's not a real danger, and they probably can just wait if they want to. Yeah, I it's, think that, it's interesting. I, I think that where Brett Yormark kind of comes into this is you've been aggressive thus far, um, and, and it's worked for you, and your conference has. I think it, it's in a, in a better place now than what we thought it was going to be. And that's great. 
how much more aggressive do you need to be at this point and how can you take advantage potentially totally. of this mess in the Pac-12? That's been the big question throughout all of this. And I think he's been uh, trying, Man, I'll, right? I'll tell you right now, like, after reading these comments from George Klavikov, I cannot even express to you how grateful I am that Brett Yormark is running the Big 12. Yep. Bottom line. I agree. I agree. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's take a quick break. 869-1240, the IHOP hotline. Thanks for watching the video streams. Tommy and I will be back right after this. So we've got a number one deluxe meal. Is there anything else I can get you? Yeah, I'd also like a good night's sleep. Maybe something like the I didn't struggle all night with my uncomfortable CPAP mask. Sir, I think what you're looking for is Inspire. It's an implant that works inside your body to treat sleep apnea without a CPAP. Come on. He sounds hangry. Inspire, sleep apnea innovation. Inspire is not for everyone. Talk to your doctor to see if it's right for you. And review important safety information at InspireSleep.com. 